starting live video. We are live. <laughs> okay, so let's start sharing it. Okay. Take your glasses off or do you need it right now? I need it right now. <laughs> Where are you? You're not there. There, there it is. Oh, lots of shadows. Shadows. Hello. Hello. We're going a few minutes early so we can get this posted everywhere. While you are waiting, go ahead and share this event. Uh, start a watch party, which you can do by sharing the event, and then it goes live. We Ooh. are trying to get it posted up everywhere, so it's going to be just a couple minutes. Hello, everybody. Hello, Kayla. Hello, Elizabeth. There we go. Nathan. Nathaniel. <laughs> Marquita. And Stacy. <laughs> You're just going to say everybody's I name as they pop up? Lauren. <laughs> Hello, Hi, Hillary. Hi, Reese. How are you? Elizabeth. Hi, Duchess Rebecca. Hi, Anne. Hi, Tegan. Hello. Hey, look, you're watching. I'm watching too. Strange. <laughs> Funny how that works. Mm. Ed. Mm. Becky. Buckets. Oh, look, it's some of my favorite people. Well, you're one of our favorites. Apparently, I am chopped liver. I didn't see you, Odette. Hello. Hi, Hello. Mandy Lynn. Okay. She was, who said my name? Who said that? That was Anne. <laughs> I can't keep up with everybody. Mm -hmm. Mihu, Peter, mm -hmm. Anne. All right. That's shared. Then, Nikolai, Her Highness. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, what we're going to do this time is this is on mute so mm. that it won't, they won't hear us here, but then I can hopefully post some pictures and some links. Okay. So at 7 o'clock, we're going to give just a couple more minutes for people to um, creep on in. And in the meantime, if you haven't already downloaded it, you want to download the handout for this class. It is a, I think, 14-page handout. Um, I am going to attempt to put up some of the pictures for those people who just can't or won't for whatever reason. But there's no guarantees because the technical <laughs> difficulties we had on Facebook yeah. last time. So hello mm -hmm. to the East. Mm -hmm. Um and then in the meantime, uh, we didn't do this last time, but I want to do this, do it this time. Mm -hmm. If you are watching, and I know a bunch of you people have already said hello, I would love for everybody to say hello, say your SCA name, and say at least which kingdom you're from, if not which barony. I just want to mm -hmm. see kind of the the spread of people that we have watching. So go ahead and sign up, sound off. There's gonna be people, mm -hmm. and then we will start putting in some. Happy links. birthday! Aaron. Oh, happy birthday, Dave Eleanor. We we sung to you. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. <sighs> we miss you guys. Yeah. Yes, Dave Eleanor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Diana's watching. Adelicia, hello. Orn, hello. Hello. Kylie, Geetha, mm -hmm. Tegan. This does not want to open up for some reason, so we may just be going without without okay. the fun bells and whistles. Okay. Oh, my mom's watching. Hi, mom. Glenabin, okay. wonderful. Yay. Artemisia. <laughs> 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 
My mom, kingdom. hi, I'm from the kingdom of motherhood. Phenomenal. Well <laughs> you are the queen of motherhood, mom. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so as people start to sound, sound off and say hello, thank you to everybody that is doing so. Uh, we are going to just do some basic introductions, kind of give some people some general mm -hmm. housekeeping, and then we're going to go ahead and get going. First of all, we apologize about any confusion about the time. We did originally schedule this for 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. However, uh, Lothar works in the medical industry and thought he was going to have to work late, so we pushed mm -hmm. it back to 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, yeah. and then there was some confusion about how the rum event mm -hmm. was. So... Um, Thank you for being patient if you were expecting us an hour ago. Um, this is a two-hour class, so we will be going... At, two hours? Yeah, at Nobody least... said anything about two hours. I did, last time. <laughs> All right. So, a two-hour class. Um, this is class number two of three. Our first class was a brief history and a primer on how to get started, and we just kind of went over the, the history of block printing. That is up on YouTube if you want to see it. Mm -hmm. You can certainly go do it. I don't think that you're going to be too terribly confused in this class if you haven't seen the other class, but I think the other class is a good primer to get you started. And then our next class, once we get you guys either you're carving your own blocks, you're buying them, or you're borrowing from somebody you, you know, um, our next class is basically how to actually stamp your fabric. So um, I will post a bunch of links in just a moment. I am loading them up right now. My computer, of course, is being terribly slow. <laughs> Um, sorry, laughing at my mom. She's being cute. Um, and uh, if you aren't already aware of this, this class is actually a RUM virtual online learning class. So like many of the other classes that you've been seeing, if you are a uh, resident of the Middle Kingdom, you can get credits towards your RUM degree. And we will go over that at the very end of the class. So anybody that's not in the mid-realm doesn't necessarily have to stick around for that. Um, we have talked about the fact that you can certainly carve your own blocks. Yeah. However, if if you really want to just learn how to carve blocks, but you don't think you really want to do it, um, or you're feeling frustrated, or you just have a time crunch, you can certainly buy blocks. And we have put up all of the links to the people that we know make blocks. Um, um, Tie-dye travels, which is now Katmandu Designs, um, Fluminous Lux, um, Vogue Medieval, and then there's another shop on Etsy that we have gotten a couple of blocks from. Um, so th we'll throw those links up there as well. The other good thing, though, is even if you're like, no way, I'm not carving my own blocks, it is really helpful for you to attend this class because it will help you look for um, design elements to buy that will make it easier to block print. There are certain certain blocks that look beautiful um, and are well-intended, not necessarily by the um, people who will link, but other vendors that I've seen. Um, and they're a little problematic because of how close some of the elements are. And so attending this class will actually help you with even just buying your own block and kind of knowing what to look for. So a bunch of you have signed on and told us where you're from. Thank you for signing off. Um, you should have a 14 page handout, which I am about to link right now because it finally loaded. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself while I'm doing that? I can. For those of you who don't know me, um, Lothar Nakshotten, Mid-Realm. Uh, not a big ANS person. I'm really not, but uh, I'm helping out and I'm learning. And as I'm going, I'm learning. And uh, I don't want to say I like it, but... Yes, you do. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, honestly, what I want to say for everybody who is coming on board with this, um, welcome and thank you for supporting both us and, again, supporting the uh, ANS in general. So yep. thank you for being here. Yep. And my name is Aveline de Sherasbrook. Uh, we are both from the Barony of Flaming Griffin in the Middle Kingdom. Um, I have been doing the SCA for about five years, mm -hmm. and we just celebrated our one-year anniversary of our um, first block-printed garb going out into the world. So we've been doing this about a year. However, I am a full-time seamstress and costume designer, so I do, do it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. This is what we do for a living. So we have hundreds and hundreds of hours of experience both in carving and printing and problem-solving, so we'll go over some of that. Yep. So I just posted the link to the handout for those of you that have missed it. Um, can you people also post it on the RUM page and the SCA virtual classroom and display space for us? Because it's hard to balance all that right now. Um, Brees, you asked how well do the carved blocks compare to the lino carved ones in terms of use and results? I think they actually um, 
When you say the carved blocks, do you mean the engraved blocks that are like laser engraved or CNC'd? Or do you mean carved wood versus carved linoleum? Let us know on that. So um, we've gone through all that. I'm going to post up a whole series of links in one more second. And then we are going to get going. Uh, hopefully it has given everybody an opportunity to grab, excuse me, the hiccups, grab the um, handout if they haven't already done so and download it, print it if you've got the opportunity, or at least have it open on a separate screen, whether it's a tablet and or laptop or computer while you're watching on your phone or vice versa. So the handout that you have, uh, once you get past the first title page, should look like this. We printed ours in black and white to be economic carved wood and, and wood versus carved linoleum. Mm. Um, I think they both print um, equally as well. The linoleum itself tends to not absorb as much of the pigment as the wood does, um, but we primarily work with linoleum, and so I don't know that I have enough experience. We have like three or four wooden blocks. Uh, no, that's not true. We have a bunch of the we have a bunch of carved, we have a bunch of laser engraved wood and blocks. So I think I like the linoleum better personally, but for tonight's class, we're also going to be working exclusively on linoleum because I think it's a really good place for you to start um, mm -hmm. and not feel overwhelmed because carving wood is much more difficult than carving linoleum. So uh, we want to give you just a little bit of a history about extant blocks in the first place, kind of what did they use. Um, and so that's why you see, this is all me, <laughs> you can stay in the screen, silly, <laughs> let's do this. So that's why you have um, this handout, which shows you, and we talked about this in the last class, the ancient Sumerians about 3000 or 3200 BCE to somewhere around 2900 BCE were already using... Um, clay and bone cylindrical seals and tablets to print on the clay tablets in which they did a lot of their record keeping and mathematics and some of their marketing and uh, ledgers, things like that. So that is just a demonstration about people um, at that time saying, you know, I'm really kind of tired of doing this over and over and over again. I want to automate or mechanize this process so that I don't have to you know, hand do the same images or the same numbers or same figures every single time. So um, though this very first page of images doesn't necessarily show you a wood block, I did want to kind of show you sort of 5,000 years ago what people were already starting to do and try to um, make their lives a lot easier. I know that tonight we have some people that are going to be carving in some clay and some uh, modeling clay. I think that is uh, Mistress Aveline and her daughter Evelyn. So hello if you're watching. Um, while we do not have any extant blocks that are still in clay, I firmly believe if you look at sort of the development of the technology of things, that the very early blocks were most definitely done and used in clay. At what point that changed, I don't know, but I'm sure that there was a certain point where um, they said, you know, that's not as sturdy and with all the sort of rocking and, and uh, hitting of the blocks onto your textile to make sure you're transferring the image as well as possible, they were getting a lot of cracking. And so they probably started changing over to some other materials, which we'll go through. Uh, Breeze asks, because straight, excuse me, staining wood today and the wood yeah. absorbs some of the ink, depending on the wood. Right. The people I was, excuse me, the poplar I was using, right. uh, it was very important in that regard. Right. Yeah, so, that's yeah. kind of what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, the, the poplar is, even though it's considered one of the hardwoods, it is actually this one of the softest of the hardwoods, so you're really going to get a very high absorption rate, and it's also going to, you're going to lose starting the crisp, the crisp edges with that particular type of wood. Um, so it's just something to think about later on. Yeah, but. so not as period, but I prefer carving and I prefer printing with linoleum, though mm. we certainly buy a lot and use a lot of wood. And, you know, my dream project at some point is going to be to actually carve in some pear wood that we got. So, uh, but that hopefully will answer your question. Oh, there's Mistress Aveline. She's Aveline. She said hello. So, all right. So the next page of your handout um, for those who do not have that, I will show you. Looks like this. And it is very interesting because it's actually a bronze printing block. Um, you don't see a lot of metal blocks, though you will see a little bit later in the handout. There are some. So certainly metals, there is bronze, there is copper, there are some iron ones that we've seen. Um, 
metal was actually used for printing. I'd be very curious to see what that is like. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of a pain that would be. I haven't yet tested that, but we do know that very early on um, there was uh, metal blocks. And that one actually dates to the second century BCE, and it uh, is from Guangzhou, China. The next page in your handout, these are both from the books by Robert Ferrer. Can I put a protective coating on the wood to prevent the uptake of the paint? That would, or that would cause problems. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I don't think it would. I think it wouldn't work well, and it would make your pigments slide around. Mm -hmm. So. And this, I don't know for sure one way or the other. So. <laughs> this page here is from uh, some of the books from the 1890s from Robert Ferrer. He was an archaeologist that. Um, helped do some of the dig in Akmim, Egypt. It's where he found a significant number of block printed textiles. And we think, we, we speculate that that's where his sort of love of block printed textiles came from. Um, during that dig, he found, or they, I shouldn't say him personally, but they found two blocks. One is that cylindrical block that you're seeing at the top of your um, screens that was actually a stamp carved on both ends. So the two images next to it are the images that you are seeing um, them what transferred when they actually tested out those blocks. Those are actual transfers. The block below that, which is this beautiful one down here, um, and sorry, the first one they dated to about fourth century of the Common Era. Era. The one below that uh, they date somewhere between the seventh and eighth century, and it was actually found in the grave of somebody that they believed was a. Uh, block printer like that was professionally what he did and they know this because of the burial rites and how um, People were buried with certain things that were supposed to reflect what they did for a living And so that's why they have identified that as well as some other tools that were in his grave um, That he was in fact a fabric um, Printer which also shows that it was a very esteemed profession at the time The next page um, a lot of people you probably have seen this on Pinterest. It looks like this and this one is currently held in the Met Museum. It's a wood block. We don't know, um, unfortunately, the two, three wood blocks that we've talked about so far, we don't know what any of them are made of. I have heard recently this that this one down here, they believe was made from sycamore, but I'm trying to chase down that lead to see if that's accurate or a guess or somebody's actually examined it or what. So um, this one, we don't know what the wood is, but it is about three inches tall by two and a half inches wide. It's beautiful detail. Uh, I actually would love to, we, we need to try this one. I think we need to remake this one. Okay. I'd probably want to do it a little bit bigger. Um, also, because the level of craftsmanship that one needs to get this detail in that small a space, something for you to think about. I'd probably go maybe a ratio of twice the size. Yeah. Um, and that one's dated to the 10th century in Egypt as well. You will find that a lot of the blocks that we know of today um, and that we specifically know were for the purposes of fabric printing and not paper printing or for seals or even there are some stamps that are used to stamp in bread. Um, we can usually tell based on what it's made of, um, whether it has like an intaglio, what, does it go in and try to create um, images that like when pressed against the bread you would see those things but when pressed against a flat surface it wouldn't. So that's kind of how we know this was necessarily for fabric block printing and this is probably for something else. Um, and Egypt obviously because of the climate has many more preserved um, blocks than any other area that I'm familiar with. Then this one, you flip the next page, you see two more. This one at the top unfortunately is the best drawing that we're going to probably ever get. It was found in the Rykovetsky settlements in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, it is dated sometime between the 11th and 13th century, but probably on the earlier end of that. Um, it's actually made out of stone. It didn't tell us what stone, but it, I do know because I translated this, this document that it is not clay because they were very specific when they talked about this is made of clay and this is made of stone. So we don't know what kind of stone, but we do know that it was in fact carved in stone. Uh, and then you can see sort of the top level design. I wonder whether or not this one may have been used to also do seals on documents, but I don't know enough to say for sure. But right now, the archaeologists have deemed it that this, it actually, the Russian translation is fabric stamp, or excuse me, stone stamp for fabric printing. So um, the next one on the bottom is from the 11th through 13th century Egypt. It is currently held in the Stotlika Museum of Berlin. 
Um, this shows a seated figure with long hair. She's playing a lute, and uh, she's under some arches, so they believe she is sitting under an arcade. Next. Got this one. And this one is another one of the metal ones. They said that this is a copper alloy textile printing block. It's also in that museum in Berlin. Um, it is dated between the 12th and 14th century of Egypt, and they believe that it was basically used to stamp along the hem of a garment, whether it was a tunic, a dress, uh, anything of that sort. Then you have this one, and it's on the next two pages. This first page actually shows the block itself, and then they did in fact do a test print of the block. Now this block is interesting because it's the oldest known woodcut from the Western world. It is dated sometime between 1380 and 1390, I think. No, 1370 and 1380, excuse me. And it was actually found stuffed under, under a floorboard um, in a place in France uh, that was known to have been later on a printing, um, a printing house. Um, but based on the time that it was found, there is some debate as to whether or not it was intended to be printed on paper or fabric or both. Um, so this, this block called the Bois Prata is um, believed to be one of probably three blocks in a set that showed a series of biblical um, images. Um, and they know that just basically because, you know, typical uh, iconography of the Catholic Church and what did they usually show. And so this shows like the Annunciation on one side and then Christ's crucifixion on the other, which is why they think that it's part of a series that would have shown these things. This is in line with what we're seeing in the 13th and 14th century, especially in uh, Germany, but also in France, of... Um, iconographic images that are printed on fabrics and then used as some kind of decorations um, uh, in religious contexts. So the other side is on the next page and this is unfortunately the best picture we have of it because when they tested this and they got this print this dissolved. It completely crumbled. It did not survive the test print. So there there are no more photographs. This was sort of the original and only photograph that there was of it. I know there have been some attempts at restoration. I don't know that they've been very successful. And unfortunately, I can't contact them right now to find out. Um, this one was actually made in walnut. And so that's really important because on the very first page of your handout, you'll see I put a little quotation from Chinini up here that says, take a block of either nut or pear, as long as it is of good strong wood, and have it about the size of a tile or a brick, and have this block drawn upon and hollowed out a good line deep. And on it should be drawn whatever style of silk cloth that you wish, either leaves or animals, which were popular motifs at that point. And have it so divided in shape and so drawn that all four of the engraved sides will come out in a repeat and make it a finished and unified job. And on the other side, which is not engraved, it should have a handle so that you can lift it and apply it. And that is from Cinini, and that was believed to have been written in a treatise that he did about pigments and block printing um, in the late 14th or early 15th century. So um, we know that the, the woods that have been identified in extant blocks are walnut or other nuts, pear, sycamore, and acacia. Sycamore is the one that's believed in Egypt, and acacia is believed to have been very popularly used by the Indians. Um, okay, next page of the handout. So this page right here, these are both from Egypt. Uh, the top one is dated from the 11th through 17th century, and the bottom one is dated sometime between the 15th and 19th century. So if you participate in the SCA, it may be out of period, but it also certainly reflects some of the common motifs that were seen on fabrics during that time. So you kind of can't go wrong if you use a design like that. Here is one of the only Indian blocks that I've been able to find from the time period uh, of the SCA. So this is dated to the 15th or 16th century. It's gorgeous. It's also quite small. It's only about seven inches tall by about five inches wide. So for the amount of detail that was in that is just phenomenal. And we've got one more page of blocks to look at. This top one is pretty awesome. It's actually um, a block that was used for Taraz bands, and we have many more extant Taraz bands, the fabric, that demonstrate that this process was used, block printing was used to do Taraz bands, as well as other things like embroidery and, and actually weaving them like that. But we do have uh, both the block and extant fabrics that show that Taraz bands were block printed. Um, and that one's dated to Egypt sometime between the 15th and 19th century. 
Um, and the bottom one is also 15th through 19th century and dated to Egypt. So those are, to my knowledge, the only extant blocks that we have that date um, to early Renaissance period. If you're out there and you know of some other blocks that I am missing, please send me a message because I would love to broaden the catalog. But unfortunately, that is all that I have been able to find in all the museums. I do want to give a special thank you to Mistress Maria Kargashina. Um, she is from Antir and she is a Laurel. Um, and Mistress, obviously, but she is a Laurel in block printing and she was the one that was, sent me this first image here. So thank you, Mistress Maria, for sending that and allowing me to put in the handout. So that just gives you sort of an idea of what the blocks looked like, how big they were, um, what kind of motifs, motifs and design elements were um, usually included in those blocks to hopefully give you some inspiration as to what you might include in your own blocks. But just like we said in the last couple of classes, you can do whatever you want, right? This is hopefully to um, inspire you and excite you about what is available um, as, as period motifs and patterns. Um, one other note about the wood blocks that were used. For those of you that are wood carvers, you might know that when you do wood engraving, you usually want to carve along the end grain. If you are actually using wood and not linoleum for your blocks, the opposite is true for blocks, uh, block carving. You want to carve along the grain, not against the end grain. So um, I think that is it in terms of our extant blocks and our nerdy history lesson that we're gonna <laughs> make okay. you sit through before we get to the good stuff. A um, couple questions looks good we have. Do they carve end grain or cross grain? I just answered that. Um, couple of hellos. Can you put a prote protective coating? We've already talked about that. So are there any questions at this point up to just the history of what we know about blocks themselves? Um, most of them were found in Egypt, one in India, one in China, one in Russia, actually blocks, one in Russia, and then one in France. Okay. Good question. So Dame Heather Hall says, why are playing card plates are pear wood and no cross grain? So pear wood, we already covered, was a very common wood that was used for wood cuts or xylography. So that's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you saying that they were not carved on end grain or cross grain or that they were? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So go ahead and clarify on that and let us know. So um, the next section that we want to kind of present to you is you've got an idea of what was done in period and what some of the designs looked like. You can certainly do something that is period inspired, whether it's from one of the blocks that you've seen or whether it's one of the textiles that you absolutely love and you have in your Pinterest page. Um, or it could be something that's very special and um, unique to the SCA, whether it is um, your baronies, sigil, your kingdoms, um, arms, whether it's your personal arms or just something that has some very special meaning to you. Um, and so what we're going to do is show you kind of some thinking that went into one of the blocks that I'm actually carving for a client right now. Um, the client has given me permission to show you the, um, the stuff that I have been working on and show you their, uh, it's their company crust. Ooh, look, my face is all blown out in the light. Hang on a second. So. I'm not going to post this picture up because it is their company's crest. But I won't post it up in the Facebook uh, live stream, but this is their company crest. And so she contacted me to see if I could carve basically this middle area. And so we talked about some of the design elements that I would have some difficulty with um, and that I would have to kind of slightly modify so that when we go to actually carve it and print it, it won't sort of get lost. Um, one of the challenges that you will have when you are trying to do yours is that you want to make sure that you have at least one eighth of an inch, no less than a sixteenth of an inch if you think you're going to be using the brayer method, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I try to aim for about an eighth of an inch between all of our elements. Um, can you hand me no the oh here well, this one right here okay. so I need a I need a pointing object. Pointing object of yes. pointedness. This is safe. We'll point with the knife. So here you can see there are these elements right here. And I made sure to leave enough space between these elements. Let's go right here. So that when I print my paint or pigment or inks 
are not going to get stuck here and start bleeding and causing some really dirty or unclean images, blotchy. if that makes sense. Yeah, blotchy. So that's one of the things you're going to want to think about when you go to create or design your own image is you don't want it to be too close together. So unfortunately, with this particular item, you can see in the head of the dragon right here, there's a lot of closeness, especially in sort of the mane right here, the scales, as well as the mouth. There's, it's very thin, and she only wanted this about six inches by six inches. So what I did, and I don't know what the best way to do this is, so we're going to try this. Okay, so this is the original. Can you hold up the other end? There we go. So this is the original, and you can see some modifications. The color modifications don't really matter because we're really just doing the circle on the inside. But we needed some way to isolate the circle. So here you can see I put an actual round dowel or circle around the image itself. So everything you're seeing on this page, which is the mock-up for what I plan on carving, anything that's in black is intended to be carved down and carved away so that it is not printing on the fabric. Anything that is in red is what I hope to leave as the surface area that the pigment will apply to and then therefore transfer the image. So between these two, there are some slight modifications that I made. You can see quite obviously here at the top, the sort of uh, top of the mast pole is taller and bigger as well as the flag because that was just going to get lost once I shrunk it down to six inches and we'll show you in a second. Also, let me turn it this way, the dragon's head, the helm here, I actually tipped it a little bit forward so that I had a little more space to kind of flare out this mane or these scales right here. I also widened these oars here so that they were thick enough they would actually catch some paint but not so thin that I might accidentally uh, screw it up when I'm carving uh, or make them way too thin. Additionally, what else did I do? Oh, in the original one here, oh you can't see it, but in the original one the, the shields on the side here had like a circle and then another circle so it looked like a Target logo, if that makes sense. I can't do that, not at the size that they want the block. So it's really just going to be one large circle to represent the shield <clears throat> and then a dot to, and to represent the, what's that thing called in the middle of the shield? The a, boss. The boss. The boss. <laughs> like you. <laughs> so this ended up being my final printout of what I wanted to carve. So the red is obviously what my surface area is going to be. The white is going to be carved down. And then where do we go from here? This is actually the size that the client wants it. Uh, sorry, it's getting kind of too bright. It's six inches by six inches. And so now we need to take that. No, yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> We're working with very poor makeshift lighting guys. Sorry. So now we need to take this and transfer it to a block. Do you have anything you want to add at this point? I've kind no. of just been, because usually this is my thing. I'm the one that goes, okay, here's the art. We need to get it on the blocks. This is what we're going to do. Here are the elements that are going to be tough for us to either hand carve or carve with some of the rotary mm -hmm. tools. And so I usually kind of do all that stuff and the nerdy research. But mm -hmm. I promise you guys will get to hear Lothar talk soon. So I cut out the block. And I taped it in the middle of this block. Now this block is six inches by six inches, but as far as we know, Speedball does not actually sell that size. So how do we get that size? Bandsaw. We take a 12 inch by 12 inch block and we cut it into four pieces so that we have six inch by six inch blocks. So I took that piece and I, um, on the back, oh, so we, so we talked about this. Sorry, let me rewind real quick. I kind of just jumped in. The next <laughs> the next page of your handout are the tips for carving your own design, right? Your own blocks. And so the first one is basically selecting your design. That's where we're at now. So to keep, to keep everybody up to speed, we are now on number one of once you've got your design, you've selected what you want. And in my case, I was able to tweak the client's design in Photoshop to get all the elements to kind of stay put where they needed to be. Once you've selected your design, now you want to print it out and you want to transfer it to the block. So it's taped here, but why? Well, let me show you some dumb things that I did in the first place and then eventually got real smart because somebody told me how to be smart. So this is a, a, a second go at a block that I've already done. I did this block initially for their Royal Majesty's Akushambela last year. That was, in fact, the first block that we ever carved. Um, we gave that block to the Royal Majesty so that nobody else would ever have that block. Uh, and this one is modified, changed a little bit differently. So... 
when I did that, I originally cut out my mock-up, every single piece, like I cut out along all of the wings, the inside area, it was very tedious. And then I put it against, actually go this way, I put it against my block and then I slowly traced everything and it took me like three hours. Yeah. Because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and yeah. this, this seemed like the best way to do it. So then I did a really complex design that there was just no way to cut all that out and that was this one. This is from the Menelagian of Basil II and you can see there's a whole lot of elements that are just kind of difficult to cut out. So what I did was I printed out like this and then I slowly like lifted it up, drew, lifted it up, drew, like kind of using this as a guide to slowly draw and that took me like four or five hours and I thought there's got to be a better way wasn't very smart, couldn't figure it out at first. The next one I did, I was like, okay, so this is a symmetrical image, it's a Celtic cross. So I like cut out some parts and so I could just keep spinning it to trace. I still wasn't figuring it out until somebody said, hey. No, this one, this one, this one's good too. That one, yeah, yeah. this was a pain. So here are all these examples, right, of me making life way more difficult on myself than I needed to. You guys can all laugh at me now because I'm laughing. Then somebody said, hey, um, why don't you just do it like we used to do in middle school and in elementary school? And I said, what are you talking about? And they're like, you know, you take the back of your page. Ooh, too bright. You take the back of your page, you take your pencil lead, you turn your pencil kind of sideways, you get it all, all the carbon and the lead here, and then you flip it over, you tape it to your block, and then you outline everything in pen. Ha ha, see, people are laughing at me now. Go ahead and laugh, because I was dumb. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did it that way, and I was like, oh, this is so much easier. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes and my silliness. Um, Today, in anticipation of this class, I put the lead on the back. Yes, homemade transfer and carbon paper, exactly. If you don't have transfer paper, that's how you do it on the cheap cheap. So I did this today. Once I printed it out and taped it down, it took me 15 minutes. <laughs> not three hours, not five hours. Mm -hmm. And so once I went ahead and went through and traced everything, you will see what, what it looks like right now. I think people are laughing at me, but let's see if there's any questions. <laughs> laugh at you. I love you more for it. Thank you. Yes, and hooray for carbon copies. Graphite paper works the same way and, sorry, it's so bright, and you don't need to waste your pencil. Okay, I just didn't have that, but that's the quick make it, make it at home trick. So we're going to go ahead and lift up the tape right here and you will see how everything, Ooh, so bright. Ta-da! Very bright, but I'm trying to show you. A little bit more shadow. Yeah. More shadow. Nope. No, I can't see too anything. Too much shadow. So there you go. There you have it. You can see the back. I did the carbon transfer. Oh, still so bright. Sorry, guys. Kind of blown out. Where I knew my image was. Mm -hmm. So what I recommend you do after you have the pencil is you actually go ahead and take a Sharpie and you just start coloring in all of the areas that you know that you want to keep. Or you can do it the other way, just make sure you're consistent when you do it. And also that will help prevent you from carving away parts of your design you don't want to carve away. Ask us how we know. Yeah. Next question, if you have a printer with toner, you can also reverse the image, print it out, and then iron over it. Oh, that's interesting. The heat transfers the toner to the item item learn this about learn about this from pyrography oh, well that's a really cool. great trick very neat i didn't know that so so that's how you go ahead and you transfer it to your block and then like i said i highly recommend because especially while you're working and you're carving your hand is going to slowly sort of rub away or smudge significantly some of your pencil and so that way it will prevent you from rubbing away all your hard work i would not use a pen because a pen will probably press down into your linoleum a little bit and might create indentations in your um, in their linoleum that you just don't want to have. Okay, any questions about the beginning step of like, how do I make my design? 
how do I get my design on my block and how do I even like get started never heard that one yep that's a cool cool trick Put this over here wait to see if there's any questions before we move on to the next section questions now is the time Okay, so once you have drawn it out, you darken your image, you've got it ready to go, you're going to get out your tools, mm -hmm. and you're going to get going. So okay. do you want to go ahead and grab up here all of our manual carving tools? Yeah, that's fine. Which block am I working on? Um, why don't we work on the Chassis block? Either one. Uh, actually, the broader one's yep, probably better. absolutely. Z. Block in question. Peter Carmichael says, or you can use a CNC machine. Yes, you can. <laughs> so, so, go ahead. Things of safety. Again, we talked about this about the other day. Um, the gloves of preventing yourself from cutting your fingers off. And going to the hospital for stitches. Yes. All right. So a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, I picked up 100 sheets of 9 inch by 12 inch pack on Amazon for $8 last summer. That's great, Adrian. I will actually add that to our Amazon shop for anybody that wants that. Uh, Peter, do you do blocks for sale? If you do, feel free to throw the link up here because I'm promoting everybody I can. Hopefully the last link I tried to put went up. If not, I'll do it at the end of this class because I'm just kind of putting up anybody that does blocks. Go ahead and take a look at their stuff. Then Brees asks, do you know of a good source for pear wood? Not a commercial source. I got mine from a gentleman who is a tree cutter who sells pear planks for um, cooking, like barbecuing and grilling. And I contacted him and said, I don't, because he was selling them like 30 packs. And I was like, I just want one or two. I explained to him what I was doing, and then he just gave me some for free. But that was last year. I don't know if he has any more. Um, he does it for barter. Okay, so contact Peter if you want to do a CNC. Mm -hmm. So let me do this. Okay. So you can see what Lothar is doing. Maybe. All right. Hmm. Is there a better way to do this? Uh, probably just tilt the whole thing forward. You want me to? Me yeah, help. probably just go manual. All right, All right, beware the shaky. All right, so we're working with actually two of our different chisels again. Yep, that's good. And then just again, you have the the different widths, and again the curvature of one. Yep, that's good. <laughs> Got it. And then we need the, a camera, man. Good curvature of the second. So, um, and those are called gouges. Gouges. So, for a larger area, like if I was going to get started, I'd probably go with the the, the wider one here because you can. We're going to go with right here, so you can kind of see what you're looking at going. So it's got a nice little gash into it. So the problem is that you get to that very end and you want to, so you have to be really careful around your edges. I am not good at this. <laughs> People who are good at this could probably just in their sleep, like watching TV or whatever. That is definitely not me. Uh, just really want to show you the different widths here. So here's the one that's a little bit thinner. And he should basically be just putting the barest amount of pressure. If you have to be pushing way too hard, that means your tools are probably too dull. So mm. when you first get going, you probably won't have this problem. But as you continue to work on projects, you may experience this sort mm -hmm. of like, wow, it's really tough to push or pull these particular um, tools 
what's going on, it's because you probably don't have sharp enough tools. You either need to sharpen them, which is a whole other class and tutorial, um, or you just need to replace them, especially if you're buying sort of like the 10 or $11 cheapy sets that... Yeah, and I think this better. set was, what, somewhere around in the 30 to 35 Yeah, I range. think that's $36 on Amazon. Yeah. This set is fantastic. It's called the yeah. Missy, Missy Sioko. Oh, but, yeah, it's backwards to me. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so the Chocoto Power Grip. So, okay. All right. So that's tools, which are just really time consuming and wonderful if you want to go the full period route. But why do that when we are anachronistic? Wait, we need to show them some more of the tools. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're going to show more? Okay. Right. So here's one that's actually very, very small, um, very narrow. I'm going to do this actually cross grained here so you can see just the difference. Well, it's not actually cross grain because it's well, linoleum, but you're going the opposite direction. Right, that. So, like I said, not a woodworker. Don't know the terminology. So, this would drive me insane. I love this minutia. And I this, find this very cathartic. Right, and me, I'd much rather just, you know, go mow my grass and meditate. So, this, not my thing, but... So that's a number... I think that is a number mm. nine. It's a three millimeter number nine gouge. That was one of the three tools that I say I use the most. I love using my three millimeter number nine gouge, my nine millimeter number three gouge, which was that first big fat one that he showed us, and then a V parting tool. Can you grab the V parting tool really quickly? And then while he's grabbing that, we've got some questions. What is your saying the V parting tool? What, what are you talking about? It's the V one. The one oh, looks like oh, a V. Ah, okay, so Hillary says, name or type of gloves. They are cut-resistant gloves. They are in our shopping list. It's also like a, a butcher's glove. Sometimes they're called a butcher's glove. Or sometimes shrimping, deveining gloves, we've heard right. them called. Um, yep, it was in the handout. Mm -hmm. I had them on the Amazon list, correct. Yeah. If you go to the last page of the handout, there's a list too. Yes, thank you, Duchess Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, that is there just for anybody that maybe didn't attend the first class, so you can see all the mm -hmm. things listed there. The bent or curved gouges will make it easier to not dig too deep. You're right. So the the flatter the um, more shallow. Yeah, the, the more, more shallow, shallow the, the curve. curve. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Then you won't go super deep. Mandy Lynn said, that last one is uh, that carved my thumb out last year, which is why we recommend the gloves. I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. Yeah. Do you incise the outline of your pattern with a knife before you carve the rest out? No, I do not. Uh, bent or curved gouges will make it easier, not too deep. Sorry, we're way too bright. Okay. okay. So I think we've caught up with all of the... Uh, do you want to use the little weird, this one? Yes, I'm going to show you this. Okay. But we're getting too close to the light, I think. Okay. So, all right. so... Show them first. There you go. Okay, let's do it this way. No. Yep, you can see it. See how it's in a V? This is the larger V parting tool that we have. Why don't I incise? Because, okay, let me show you. So here you can see a lot of dust because after we did some basic carving, we also did the... Um, the Dremel tool, which we'll get to in a second. Let's go like this. Actually, can you hold the I can. phone? You want the, here, uh, here, take this. Yeah. Take the glove of gloving. There we go. Take my ring off. Okay, you need to tilt it down for yeah, me. Yeah, i just, you know. Okay. So, as I'm carving, I'm going to leave, if I'm hand carving, I leave about a, a sixteenth of an inch. Can you bring this back so there's a little bit more light so we get a lot of shadows there? Yeah, but then I'm, they're not getting the details I need. Okay, so if I'm hand carving these and not using the Dremel tool, I leave at least a sixteenth of an inch. If I'm Dremel carving, I usually leave at least an eighth of an inch. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up as close as I can to that margin I just told you, and I'm gonna carve down as far as I want. And then once I've carved down everything as much as I want, I am going to take, can you hand me one of the straight? Yes. I'm gonna take either a disposable scalpel or an X-Acto knife, like so. 
And then I have to lay this flat, so you're gonna need to come up. Okay, and then move like there. There. Okay. So what I'm gonna do next, once I've gotten close, then I start incising. But I don't wanna do it beforehand because it kinda of screws things up from my experience. So I'm going to incise along that line. I do it a couple of times repeatedly. And I'm slowly trying to get down as deep as I can. And then I'll tilt this a little bit to kind of start to break it. And then I'll tilt away. Can you guys see or is it too bright? Okay. Now you can see right along here, I've gotten all the way up to my permanent marker so that it is really crisp. And then you see how there's a little bit left here that is kind of raised up beyond where the other stuff is. That's when I would take my three millimeter number nine gouge once again, and then I'm gonna go here And usually I will try to do it kind of on the sideways so that I don't accidentally dig into the line. Well, uh, nice and crisp. It's so bright, though. I don't know. Let me yeah. see if I can do this. Okay. Mm. So, let's try, try it from this angle. Okay. See if you can see. I'm now going to do it on the other side. So you can see I've already carved out a whole bunch of it. This is actually all just kind of dust and powder. Okay. So, again, I'm going to take... This tool, which is just a straight blade, I think it's an Exacto 3000. And now I'm going to start incising along the outer part of my element. I don't try to push down too hard because I'm going to do it repeatedly so that eventually it'll go deeper and deeper okay. each time. Thank you, Alessandra. Excellent. It's much easier to see. Okay, good. Sorry, guys. And then once I feel like I've gotten down about as far as I can probably go, I'll gently start pushing that cut linoleum away. Have we ever tried cutting out a rubber or neoprene 2D, 2D image and gluing it to a flat block for printing purposes? Yes, and we'll show you that in a second. So now I'm going to take this, and I'm going to just kind of go along the edge of that and clean it up so that it is flat. Or, or carved all the way down, all the way. Now, one of the biggest tips that we put at the top of your handout, and also that you can see that both of us are attempting to do while awkwardly <laughs> positioning the camera, is you always wanna be carving away from yourself. Even when you need to be carving, like if suddenly I needed to, be, to carve here, I'm not gonna try to do it this way or this way. You're gonna be constantly moving your block and reorienting your block so that hopefully as much as possible you are carving either away from yourself or at a bare minimum to the side, usually to whatever other hand you are not. So I am right-handed, I am carving towards my left in this instance, but you do not wanna be carving towards your body. Um, we fortunately did not make that mistake to know that tip. We just practice good sound safety procedures for the most part, it's fine. It's just reloading so we can post up some more links. Okay, so can they see? That was better when it was down on the down flat. Okay, there we go. Much better. Yep, and then how much deeper would you go on the edge? Okay, so here you can see this corner is kind of at the moment pretty much where the linoleum ends and you start to get into the wood block itself, mm -hmm. right? I would probably yeah. take this down to about here, yeah, under probably halfway on the corners only. Yeah. 
And that is because when you go to block print, what you will be doing is you'll be rocking the print a lot and like pressing in the corners. And while you're trying to get... Which you'll learn more about on <gasps> April 14th. Like here, you can see this block. We have massively beveled down these corners. Because if you don't, look what happens up here. You get a lot of paint transfer. And every time I got the paint on the block before mm -hmm. I could put it on my fabric, I would have to wipe it away, mm -hmm. which is very tedious. Yeah. You want to be here. careful not to, though, go down too far. Because if you go down too much further than about half the block's width, you will compromise the structural integrity of the block itself, and you could crack your block mm -hmm. while either just pressing or even using a mallet. Yeah, so where's a good example? Here, here, we did this, like this one here. You can kind of... Yep, you're good. Mm. So where we just basically... But again, this is essentially a total surface block in the sense that we're using all, all corner or all the total surface area but on the sides we just really brought this down so that when we're pressing there's no chance of getting additional unnecessary unwanted paint on your fabric because yeah. yeah and then in terms of how far down we go we had this conversation at the last class and it's important to have it too I go to at least the bottom of the linoleum, which is usually about an eighth of an inch, depending on your block. And then I usually carve down even more. I try to get at least a quarter, if not a half inch. Quarter is my bare minimum optimum. If I don't go deeper than an eighth of an inch, if I just stay where the linoleum ends and the wood begins, I find I get a whole lot more transfer method when, or transfer when I use the stamp pad method, not the brayer method. Mm -hmm. All right, some questions here. Oh, okay, so you asked about, so here's an example in one of the very first classes I took from uh, Lady Aoife of Shadowed Stars. She basically just had us take craft foam and then we cut out the shape that we wanted and we literally just glued it onto some random pieces of wood that we have. And this actually um, stamps remarkably well for just a small project or like if you're doing one little piece, you know, a, a, some cuffs and maybe a hem around a tunic and you know you only want to use it once, you might decide to use something like this, or you can sometimes buy, like, these are ink stamps, but again, you have to be careful because this element right in here is not down deep enough to actually not get a lot of transference, so you got to be very, very careful when using that. And then this was actually what Aoife did with Lothar. Mm -hmm. um, she uses, can you grab some of those other... Yeah. So these are just like little craft pieces mm -hmm. that you can glue. And then if you're just doing a small project and you're using a brayer or you're being very careful with a stamp pad, mm -hmm. these are only about an eighth of an inch thick. You can mm -hmm. use those too. Mm -hmm. Now for long-term wear, you'll like see right up here, the long-term wear these break down fairly easy. So if I'm gonna be using this to press because I've lost that intersection because it's just basically kind of a pressed, I don't know if it's cardboard, just a heavy construction paper, but if I was gonna use this to block, this piece would drop down and I would lose, more than likely lose some of that detail work on the block. Can you grab the speed ball and talk about that? You can talk about that. Okay. So. So this is also on the shopping list if you're interested. Um, this is called Speedy Cut. You can usually find this in this color or usually a pink color. And you can do very similar um, to what was done with the craft foam, but you can get a lot more mm -hmm. precision than craft foam. Craft foam, as you can see on this inner part, is a little more difficult to, mm -hmm. um, to cut cleanly, whereas this one cuts mm -hmm. much more like a rubber eraser. Right, and you could actually glue this to your block prior to actually doing your carving and then carve that out and peel that off and you can use um, you know rubber cement or anything anything really to keep that in place so you don't necessarily have to carve this and then try to attach it it might be easier to do it the other way so okay would you ever just cut away excess I'm not sure if I understand that question Adrian and then you could probably glue two of the craft outlines together and attach them to the block. Yes, mm -hmm. you've made a pack with that stuff. Which stuff? Mm -hmm. The uh, the speedy design stuff? 
um, Heather, or otherwise? I, I know um, um, Catalina, Mistress Catalina, oops, sorry. She has carved individual blocks and then mounted all those blocks to one big block so that she gets the same uniform spacing between elements before, which is actually a pretty smart idea. We have not had the opportunity to try that yet. Yeah. So the pink speedy stuff, yeah. Um, can you hand me that box right there? This box? We did have a question last um, class, and it's important to mention here, the difference between the linoleum tools and the wood carving tools. So Speedball sells a little set and they come in different variations, but it's usually just like this. And what you'll get is sort of an ergonomic handle that has various tips that you can pop in and out. And these are specifically made for linoleum. Almost look a little bit like a calligraphy pen, right? And then it's kind of cool because in the end of this, you just spin this off and then all of your tools are on the inside. And the tools come in various, basically, gouges and shapes, like that one is very similar to some of the wood cutting tools you'll see. Here you have various shapes and size gouges. Put it against my face so you can see. Um, and then you can see Lothar's kind of playing with it right now. I will tell you, I did not particularly love these. I felt like the quality was pretty chintzy. And I feel like you get better quality tools when you buy any of the wood carving sets than you do with the linoleum. And they're just as expensive. Because I think this one... These would rock on the little foam pads, though. If you're ever going to... The if, little speedy carving yeah, pads. Yeah, if you're yeah. going to go, you know what, I, I just want to keep it light and easy. And this is really the level that I want to take it to. Um, this would be perfect for that. So, if that's the direction you want to go. Yeah. Okay, Adrian clarified her question, and you're absolutely right, and now I get your question. So she said, a lot of the extent blocks have the excess wood cut away so that there isn't extra wood around the motif itself, and you're absolutely right. Um, that is the way you should do it. You should, if you were carving the whole thing out of wood, um, you would want to do that. And there have been, I don't know if we have... We'll just get rid of all of this. Yeah. So, and I talked about this actually when I was with somebody recently talking about this. So I should, in theory, have cut around here, here, maybe even a little bit in here, and then up here, and then symmetrically on both sides, if, if it was going to be like an extent block. The worry that I had, and this is, this is actually a very specific project and why I couldn't, I had no room for error. This was a commission and I had three weeks to get it done because uh, they were being invested as the new baron of their barony. And it was a very quick turnaround. And so in that instance, I was worried that if I cut this excess area, that while pressing, because it this is only two inches from here to here, I was worried about the block itself cracking, the structural integrity. The speed blocks, okay, the linoleum mounted, uh, wood mounted, wood mounted linoleum blocks even with the linoleum themselves, are only about seven eighths of an inch. They aren't even a full inch deep. Um, most of the extant blocks mm -hmm. are remarkably de deep, from at least one inches to sometimes three inches. Yep. And then a second, you know, a second thing to look at is that when you're doing your printout on the back, we've got basically the line set up like, oh, this is the top. So you've got this whole piece that when you're actually setting up your block, and we'll show that again on the 14th, um, it's gonna help you lay your patterns out a little bit better right. too, so. So it wouldn't have been the end of the world to cut it away, but because the linoleum blocks in particular are so th relatively thin compared to extant wood blocks, you do risk your thing cracking. I have never had one crack personally, but I have heard stories of them doing that. And in that instance, and in many of the instances, I'm working on a tight deadline where I don't have the luxury of carving something. Because you would you would not probably want to carve it. You would probably want to cut it after it was carved because sometimes your things you think are going to be one shape, but you need extra space. Like the, um, the block that I'm doing for the client. Right? So so that it's easy, I'll just show you the printout. In this, if theoretically, I think I'm only gonna need this much space. But what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna end up carving in the mouth, the sort of line right there that it, that de demarcates the top jaw and the bottom jaw. And when I do that, once I see how thick that is, 
I will go, ooh, I can't make that, that lower jaw as thin as I thought it was going to be. I need to add some extra space. And so sometimes as you're carving your design, as, no matter how well it was planned, you realize you need to leave yourself some extra space on things. So I would not recommend cutting it out before you carve. You'd want to do it after you carve. And then you do risk the structural integrity of the block itself being compromised because it is like a, it's like a particle board wood kind of, it's not, it's not like a real wood. It's like a pressed wood mm -hmm. with linoleum on top. And so, especially if you are using your blocks a lot and then you're washing them to get them clean and then the blocks get kind of wet and then they got to mm -hmm. dry them, they can start to warp and get kind of weird. Um, can you grab the, the Metalogian block? It's beneath the Celtic cross. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. You flip the camera around. Yeah. So it's hard to tell. The back of this is very textured and, and uh, fuzzy almost. And the very corners of this are really starting to get sort of um, worn down and dulled. And that's just simply from using this so much and washing it. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of the blocks not quite being quite as structurally sound as the extant blocks that were carved out of like solid hunks of wood. So hopefully that answers that question. All right, any other questions about the manual tools, whether you're using linoleum tools, which I don't recommend. They may be a few bucks cheaper than just a basic set of wood carving tools, but I think it's one of those situations mm -hmm. where you, especially with wood carving tools in general, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. If you buy a ten or ten or eleven dollar kit at Joann's or on Amazon or at any craft store that's near you, it's going to be good for a couple of things, and then you're going to need to buy them. This set that we got that is thirty six dollars. There's probably one tool in here that I probably really need to sharpen, and I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. But the quality of these tools have lasted us, how many blocks would you say we've carved? Uh, At least a dozen. Uh, I mean, and, and we're talking some pretty intense carvings, mm -hmm. very detailed, very intricate, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. So you get what you pay for. The linoleum tools, in my opinion, are not worth it, which I think, mm -hmm. I don't think I even have any listed in my Amazon store for that very reason. I mm -hmm. just kind of wouldn't recommend it, even if they are only five or six bucks. And if I do, it's just mm -hmm. like, I put one in there because if somebody is really on a tight budget, then it'll at least get you started. Mm -hmm. I know in the last class we did have some people ask us about um, dental tools as well as some of the ceramic sculpture tools. And I want to address that here. Um, that is a, a great option if you're doing some carving and engraving and you need some very subtle um, peaks and valleys and shapes. But when you are working with linoleum or even just a flat planed wood that you know you need to press against the surface and you need those surfaces to be paralleled. My experience is that the dental tools and these um, like the clay sculpture tools don't give you anywhere near the effect or the depth that you need for those things. Okay, so we have talked about carving and we put on this handout, there's a few more trip tips we just want to make sure we go over about go over with you. We talked about how you want to make sure you're carving away from yourself when appropriate and when you have it, make sure you're using safety gear like this or even safety goggles or in our case, most of the time when we are carving because we are old and it helps us see a little bit. Eh, we where's use my spoon? reading glasses. Can you hand me the magnifying glass all the way over there? Oh. We talked a little bit about magnifying glasses and lamps. They could be useful, but you would have to kind of be in front and under it. And sometimes you want to bring it right here because you're working on something. What? <laughs> Do you know what that is? Yes. New work. So no. this is from my grandma. This is a quilting magnifying glass, and it's supposed to, in theory, rest ah. against your chest so that you can work on your project like this. Um, I don't have luck with it. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't tend to want to stay where I need it to stay, but some people might find that they have really good luck with these. I don't know what this is actually called, so if you do quilting or if you know what this is called, please throw it up here in the comments so other people can find it if they think that that is something mm -hmm. that they would enjoy or get good practical use out of. Other tips, especially for manual carving, is take your time. Go through each one of those tools that you got in your kit mm. and find out... You like it? Yeah. It's not bad, see? Yeah. <laughs> Turn it this way. Yeah, I don't have as much luck with it with my girls. <laughs> So, um, that's going to really be yeah. trippy. So take your time, learn your tools, see what each one does, work with them a little bit mm -hmm. so that you can decide what your preferences are. And then when you get, 
I said this in the last class. I have like three, maybe four tools that I use. Mm -hmm. There are other ones I could be using, and there may be a, a time where we're like, oh man, I really probably should have switched out to a, a larger gouge so that I could have gotten this done quicker. But I, mm -hmm. I have my preferences, and that's okay. So work with the tools, play with them. And when you're going to go to carve, um, like this block right here, this is perfect. So you got this, these big, broad areas. Use your tools on these areas. Find out how those tools work. How do they feel? How much mm -hmm. pressure do you have to put? Um, how quickly are you able to do things? I will tell you, sometimes it is really appealing to be like, oh man, look at how long this is. It's going, it's going. You don't want to do that. <laughs> While it is somewhat satisfying to be like, look at this long peel I got. That is where you end up screwing up and going too far and losing control of your tools and then you cry and it's no good. Mm -hmm. So start small, carve in small and short strokes, especially when you're first getting going so you don't get carried away. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever possible, spin and orient your blocks so that you are continuing to carve away from you. But also, so if I'm carving, right, I don't want to, generally speaking, if I'm carving, I don't want to carve in towards that circle. I want to carve this way. I want to carve this way. I want to carve this way. And then I'm going to work my way around those things. Can you hand me the other chosses block? Circles are horrible. I hate them, but yeah. they look great. They really, really do. But oh, yeah, they're really a which pain. one? This one. Yeah. Like I said, circles. Lots of little tiny horrible circles. So here, you can see in the areas that I have not actually done yet. You see these weird lines? So what are they and why are they here? Well, I used a stylus from the Dremel set, which Walter Lothar will go over in a second. That is to dig channels that I can then um, dig towards. Yeah, I want to dig towards them so that my stuff is breaking away in those directions and it's not breaking away in the direction of this because I have popped off little circles before and that's how we ended up with a modified block one time because the circles mm -hmm. I was carving off accidentally over and over again. So um, can you hand me the Persian one over there? Mm -hmm. Yep, below that. And then the wood filler. Hmm? The wood filler, the yellow thing over there. Yep. Okay. So do you see this right here? This was an accidental huge gouge that Oops. I made while I was carving and I cried because I thought the whole thing was ruined. And I said, no, we could maybe probably more than likely fix this. Not all is lost. Wood filler. Uh, simple, easable, stainable wood filler. There's probably multiple different brands. Um, put it in. Use a putty knife or like a gift card just to kind of smooth it over. And the great thing is... The way this prints on fabric is no different than how the linoleum prints on fabric. Mm -hmm. So there isn't like a texture difference. It's not absorbing more of the pigment than the linoleum is. It doesn't, you know, tend to tend to stick to it more than the other one. It, it worked remarkably, remarkably well. Mm -hmm. We haven't had to use the wood filler very often, but we I think we had to use it twice on this one. I don't know what the other. Maybe this and one other. Mm -hmm. But it's an amazing tool. And I think this is like six ninety nine. If that. It's a way to preserve. Like I think I had been carving on this for like uh 14 hours when i gouged it and i was like 14 hours is lost not for 6.99 it's not <laughs> so um try all your different tools and then as we talked about another tip was uh, make sure you carve close to your design elements that you want to keep but not all the way up because then you're going to use your straight edge whether you're using a disposable scalpel or whether you're using just an exacto acto knife um, to clean those edges and then to sort of chip away so you have very crisp, clean edges. Even yeah. when you're working with your Dremel uh, set or your rotary tool set, you do not want to go all the way up to it. Mm -hmm. And then finally, keep your tools sharp. That is a separate tutorial. But if you have to push or pull your tools way too much, and we discussed this earlier, mm -hmm. then you're doing it wrong. That's okay. No, I shouldn't say you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You're you're creating more work for yourself than you need to, and yeah. it's time to get new tools. Yeah, and and a quick note on just some of the tools. If you're going to be, the more you're doing this, you're going to realize that just having, just this. If you can see how it is, slightly ergonomic, makes a massive difference. It's a little bit thicker than your standard exacto. It has a spot where your fingers can just sit right in, and it makes everything a little bit easier, a little bit better, a little bit more precise because your hand's more comfortable 
Um, so keep that in mind if it's something you really want to do. Um, if you're really gung-ho, invest right away in the good stuff. Um, but if you're just practicing to see if it's something you want to, do what you need to. But down the road, you'll want to upgrade your things. Yeah. So I just pinned a comment. Um, you will see it has a bunch of links in it. Among those links are all the handouts that we have put out so far in the block printing series, as well as the next class event. It is the Amazon supplies list. Uh, fair, we didn't say this this time, but we did say it last time. Full disclosure, we do make a few pennies off of everything that you purchase. Every dollar we get a little kickback, but we just end up throwing that back into the arts and crafts and our teaching and um providing things to people during classes that they We're can't not necessarily putting that for. into the college fund for Oliver. I thought that's no. we discussed that. No. No, we did not. It's not enough money. It's very little. <laughs> but we do make a little bit of money and we created that Amazon list for you just basically so that it's easy cuz everything's in one place and you don't have to go hunting and searching mm -hmm. for it. So it's really honestly meant as a service to you. And then I did put the links to Katmandu Designs, Fluminous Lux, Vogue Medieval, as well as Block Printing Art, which is, um, they are based out of India. Uh, the quality of their blocks, those three circular blocks right there, is the carving, for the most part, is absolutely phenomenally beautiful. It's really, really sophisticated and uh, mm -hmm. detailed. Good I will tell itself. you, though. They have different levels and qualities of people that can carve with them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will take liberties with um, design, historical, historically accurate designs. So when, if you're interested in something like that, like this is the Fragment de Manteau um, from the 12th century. And when I went to go order it, I said, I'm worried about the level of closeness on some of these elements. Again, let me grab this. Can I see a picture? And when they sent me the picture, the lion was actually facing the opposite way. Oh, we forgot to talk about that. So <clears throat> you want your image to be a mirror. So this lion, when I look at it, appears to be pointing to the left, right? So if I were thinking I was left setting right. it, it he appears to be, yeah, left, right. <laughs> so he appears, if I set it down, to be facing to the left. But actually, remember, you're going to be going this way, so he'll print to the right. So when I looked at their block that they sent me a picture of so that I could examine the actual one they had, not just the stock image, like the, the line was facing the other direction, there were some other changes, like the person did a beautiful job, but they kind of embellished a bunch of things that I didn't want there. So just be careful if you do use that block printing art shop, um, ask for a picture of the actual block that they have. If it is really important to you for it to be historically accurate, you might not care and that's okay. Like I said, the quality of the carving is absolutely stunning. This block though, while the quality of the the carving is probably the best carved block I've ever gotten, unfortunately, the space in between these elements is not enough to not get tons and tons of bleed. And when I contacted Jalpa, who is the owner of the shop, I explained to him like, hey, you know, just so you know, I do this for a living. This is what I was encountering. I just want to give you some feedback. He's like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that because our artisans sometimes think more about just the the beauty and the intricacy and the difficulty of the carve and they don't always think about how it's going to translate when you actually go to block print with it. So when we talked about this at the beginning of the class, taking this class will also help you to learn which blocks are probably going to be easiest to block print with. So when I block print with this one, every time I get my surface wet, I then have to take either an awl or a needle or a pin and clean out every single area that suddenly is getting all this weird bleed and stick. And it is a, an exhausting and time consuming process. So while this is beautiful, especially for a four inch block, it wasn't, it was too much beauty crammed in one space that was not functional for block printing. So just bear that in mind when you look at which things you want to print. It is much like Aveline, too much beauty in one place. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to create a repeating pattern, for example, to make continuous trim, do you think it is better to make a longer block to have stamped less time or a shorter block in which the image is carved less times and therefore more consistent? That's a great question because we've kind of gone over that. It's really up to you. So we have this block, mm -hmm. which is uh, from the Roger II of Sicily. Mm -hmm. It's the motif that he has around the 
Dalmatica. Oh, look, everybody's sending hearts for you being super Aww. cheesy. So um, this one you have to actually repeat. So I have to make sure that I line it up perfectly every mm -hmm. single time. And it's one after the other, after the other, after the other. And I don't know where that yeah. trim is. Oh, it's somewhere around yeah. here. So the, the other example is we could actually make this block, just that, make a little square just like that. But then again, line it up and repeat, line it up and repeat. So we're actually going with this. So we have to line it up here spaces. and then right there. line it up here and so forth. So it's actually, uh, I, choice is a ton and ton of, the, the amount of work in this in particular is, even with the automated tools is, a lot. it's it's a week of carving. I mean, at, at our level and skill level, someone yeah. else might be able to do it faster. Laser engravers and CNC machinists are laughing at us, but they we, are. Like, we like to hand carve yep. too, so. So, and then with that, Again, once we're done, though, it's ch -ch -ch, and these are going to be spectacular. Um, hopefully, Penzik will be up and running, and we'll see you there because, so, oh, my yeah. gosh. I think our pers my personal preference, then, to answer your question, Diana, is that I would rather carve something more times and stamp less than mm -hmm. carve it only once but stamp more. That is kind of like mm -hmm. a, your mileage may vary. You may, like like to do it differently. Remember though, every time you go to stamp, you have to go back to your stamp pad and or your brayer and get your surface wet or again. So you are doing a lot more work, which is why we are moving away from doing a singular design that's repeated many, many times versus something that's carved repeated, but we'd only have to stamp it a little bit uh, mm -hmm. less times, a right. few fewer less times. Mm -hmm. My English is not so good right now. That's right. So we are getting to the end of the manual tool section. Okay. Do you want to start setting up the power yeah. tools? So, so really quick, I'm going to be setting up the Dremel here in just a little bit. And what I'm going to recommend is I'm going to go, I'm going to start now, and then I'm going to wait for five seconds so you guys can all turn your volume down. Or you can just leave it and see how loud it is on your end. Um, and then when I'm going to stop and talk, I'll sit it down and I'll hold my hands up and I'll wait for five seconds and then I'll start talking again. And definitely if you're listening to this on headphones, you want to turn the volume down because the Dremel's loud. Yeah. So, so um, right. where's the one you just started to, the, the logo, because we're going to do the edges on that. This one? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I, haven't, I haven't put it, obviously. And that's fine, but I'm going to do the corners here. Okay. So. Is this plugged in already? It is not. Okay. And the cord is here. I okay. don't, yeah, I'm good here. I just don't yep. know. We're going to go this way, actually. All right. So for anyone working with power tools, um, even just for a short period of time, earplugs are your friends. Um, protect your ears. They're the only ones you have. Um, Aveline and I both have severe hearing loss. So if you ever huh? say something to us and we look at you and we're like oblivious, um, it's probably because we didn't hear you, and it's also a, a low frequency hearing loss, which is very rare, and we both have the same thing. If we turn away from each other and we're in the other room, we can't understand or hear each other. It's kind of fun if you're ever in the house, you can just laugh at us. So, all right. All right, hang on. Let me grab this. I'm going to turn it around. So, normally... This would be all done with a uh, Sharpie marker, so it'd be very black, easy to see where the edges are, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail at this point. Um, the uh, the last um, podcast we had, we were talking about the beryllium sphere, which I don't know the name of this particular thing, um, but if you can look at the surface, I don't know how... Deep you can get it is just really really rough and it's just it's wonderful for taking broad things out so I'm gonna show you this example I don't wear the glove with this maybe I should but I've never really had an issue it's much more important with the manual tools than it is the power Got tool that... so I'm gonna turn this on in five seconds Why are you doing that? 
they have their volume off, or some of them do. So the reason is just to, again, you get familiar with your tools, you have an idea of how much area that you could be working with or cutting off. Okay, so the Dremel was less than half speed. Um, the reason I did the, the initial, the press that I did like right here was again, getting familiar with your tools. Um, even if I'm, I've used this, I don't know how many times, but at the same time, every time I'm working with a block, with any tool, I'm gonna do something similar to that in a, in a broad area if I have that just to remember and get the feel for that block. And there may be times where you're just like, eh, I'm so comfortable, I can just go and zip along. Um, I just do that for myself with every tool that I have just to remember the changes. Now, working on the edges, bringing this down, again, I, there was a point where I was just kind of going back and forth. And again, I'm letting the tool do all the work. If you're having to push with the Dremel, you're doing it wrong. You either need to increase your RPM or you need a different tool. Um, some of the smaller wood carving tools may eventually wear out as well. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit more of this. I'm gonna turn it up a little bit more so you can kind of see the difference on that. So in five seconds, if you're turning your volume down, Okay, so you can start seeing actually the base wood get a little bit closer here. So at this point, we're actually seeing where pretty much most of the linoleum has gone and you're just looking down where the wood is starting. That's, in my opinion, that's about as deep as you generally need to go for your, some of your broader pieces like this. Um, Except on the corners except on the corners where you're going to want to really, again, round those down. Um, you can kind of see the difference right here where I brought that down. Okay, so same thing here. And again, that's just so as you're rocking that, you don't get any additional paint. That's just, again, extra paint that you don't need is bad. Now, if you notice, just that little tiny bit, we have all of this. So... We've got a little shop vac that we bring in the house from the garage when we're doing this. I normally sit on the floor in front of the couch watching TV and taking little breaks, looking up and down, that sort of thing. And I just will pull the shop vac up. 
I will pull this up here. But the really big thing here is when you're working inside the block, that's when you're going to start really wanting to make sure when you're doing the detail work, you're going to stop fairly periodically, vacuum that out so you see where you're working. Because um, the last thing you want to do is make a mistake just because there's dust there that you didn't need. So um, I'm going to let Tanya speak for a little bit and I'm going to switch the end of uh, this out and bring, bring in a uh, couple other pieces. All right, hang on real quick. We have a couple of questions and sure. comments. So Alessandra says, it's so satisfying to watch it just eat the linoleum. Yes, it's phenomenal. It's really, really wonderful. And if you're doing it right, it's doing the work and not you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Diana says, I see the recommendation for the rotary kit in the handout, but can you write up the names of the attachments you are showing us? I didn't quite catch what it was called. Okay, so... There is a whole set or series um, that is called the Carving and Engraving Set. It's like, I think, 11 pieces. But Diana will try to get that listed for you after the, after the show. Yeah. Then Ananda says, that tip seems like it would be great for creating negative space polka dot backgrounds. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Alessandra says, would you suggest using a mask or tying a bandana around your face so that you don't breathe particles? Yes, we have done that in the past. Uh, you may have a difficult time getting a mask right now, unfortunately. Yeah. And then he is actually starting to put out a number of the tips. And I call them styli, but they all have different names. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's much better. Yeah. So you can see. And all these do different things. Like the ones on the, the well. two on the left tend to dig away a lot of it, whereas the two on the right are more about creating grooves and spaces between elements. Mm -hmm. And even there, it's very difficult to see, but those two stylus heads Here, on the far right, so you got... it's actually perfect. You can you see perfectly. Okay. So you... But if you notice the difference on these two, oh, it doesn't seem like a, a big difference on the sizes, but this is almost... Oh, 30% maybe yeah. larger than this one, and it'll make a massive difference on on the block. So I'm going to be loading. Uh, so again, I'm probably going to load this one up really quick, this one, and then I'm going to end up loading these two and just make some small marks so you guys can kind of just kind of see the difference. So let me get on with that. Okay. So while he is doing that, whoo. So he is going to change out the head. Um, you can use any rotary tool set that you have. We happen to use the, the brand Dremel. I think we have a Dremel 4000, but I think yes. we put both the Dremel 3000 and 4000, yeah. which are the last two right. latest and your, editions. And your father's given for Christmas, give me a great Dremel with a totally different handle that I haven't used yet. Okay, but. yep, and we have another one that we haven't gotten to use. And then a couple of other quick things. So you could just use the Dremel itself, right? But it does have this thing right here, which is the flex shaft attachment. Shaft. Oh. And that is usually between $25 and $27, um, depending on where you get it at. It is definitely worth it. It's much less heavy than the Dremel itself mm. is. It gives you a lot more mobility, as you can see as he's using it. And then this little piece right here, this black piece is actually a little mini fan. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do a huge, great, wonderful job, but it does push, and it's actually called the dust blower. Mm -hmm. It does push away and blow away enough of the basic mm -hmm. um, particles that it, it you have to stop less to clear things, right. like he said. Right, so this piece is what I used when I first started because I didn't have my very favorite little beryllium spear looking thing. I'll definitely get you guys the name on this and we'll post it up <laughs> because it is just, in my opinion, it is, it is the one to use for broad areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Let me switch around. All right, I'm gonna use this one just as an example. Again, it's very similar to this, so I probably won't even use this. Um, great for edging. I'm gonna get this started, so in one, Two, three, four, five. And again, about half speed.
That one's a lot less forgiving. <laughs> right. It is. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. So again, as uh, Avalin said, it is a lot less forgiving, and also because of the sharp right angle, it would. It's very. Again, this is very smooth and it's it's organic. I guess would be in my opinion, so what I would say. Where this, is, like I said, for the edging, phenomenal. I mean, just chews right through that. Uh, it probably even more so than my my sphere that I like to use. But then again, for going deep in, um, again, it's 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 sh sharp edges. It's it still will work for pulling broad areas. And again, for that, I always draw away for my image always, because you don't want to push in. Um, I've done this and tried to work it um, like so. I don't recommend it ever. Um, <laughs> just don't. So. Um, and then can you show them how you actually change out the pieces? Oh, yeah. So there's, this spins, and then one there's a flat edge on the inside, and you'll, you'll just press this button, and it locks it in. And then... Your little micro wrench that comes with your Dremel kit. What is that called? A chuck key? A uh, chuck key micro wrench. So, and then this piece, again, kind of similar, but again, rounded off. So a little bit, kind of a combination of the two that we're looking at um, previously. And you don't have to go super hard, just snug. And, and then we'll... you give it a little tug and you can tell that it's... Oh, yeah, definitely solid. So... All right, and then... Five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. All right. This piece, like the, the sphere that I like, it's wonderful for larger areas, but then when you start getting in here, okay, I could use this here and bring this all through this area, but then when I'm like in here, I can actually work that with this smaller piece just right in through here. So. Sorry. Yep. I, all right. I was so, trying to clear away a bunch of oh, messages yeah, that no, popped up. Okay, that's fine. So you saw the difference basically between here and here. So I'm gonna put this little piece right in here, just very faint. But again, the more I can do with the Dremel, the just the minutes and hours you're gonna save by uh, not having to do it by hand. Unless that's something you wanna do. More power to you. <laughs> Crazy people. Five, so. four, three, two, one. So for my pause. Yep. Okay. So where's the pointy thing? Here we go. The pointy thing. All right. So remember earlier how we were talking about the amount of space you want to leave? That's probably closer than I would like to Correct. be to the edge. Now, that's not the end of the world, but this is one of the things. When you go to start cutting this way, right, and slicing it or... Uh, I forget what the term is. Inside, incising. Thank you, incise. That is not leaving me enough space to get a good, clean chip off. It's not the end of the world, but what you will find is as you're doing that, because this uh, is like slowly, or not slowly, it's very quickly spinning in here, this all becomes weaker in here. So when I go to cut here with my manual tools, some of this edge might be slightly weakened. So if ever there were a fight that Lothar and I have about <sighs> carving, it's like, no, 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 don't cut too close. Right. And in this case, it's not a bad. But he mm. thought one time he was doing me a favor by getting really up close to I him. thought it would be great. I'm like, wow, I'm going to save you all this time. 
<laughs> I was yeah. like, no, you got to right. leave me space. Yep. Yeah. And the big thing, too, especially with these smaller tools, is you don't want to undermine and get underneath. You want to keep things straight down. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm going to go to the two smaller tools. <laughs> All right, I'm going to work on this side and then this side with the other one just so you can see the difference. And on five, one, two, three, four, five. So, and that was that the thicker of the two yes, stylus ends? Yeah, okay. Right. So, and then you'll see again, you know, make your line if you need to make another line, and then you can go between the two and carve that space out. But usually, if you need that much space, you're better off turning to another. Depending. Okay. Like, right? Like, if I was, if for, for here, if I was working between the uh, oars, yeah. to leave I me would enough probably, space. I would probably just do the whole thing, I'd go around it with one of the larger pieces and get this broad area, but here is where I take this and start working very slowly. Yeah. And yeah. And then I want to make an observation too, because at first you went directly down with this outer line, but then on this one you were kind of at an angle and you could see how it was opening up that channel quite a bit, which is what he was intending to do. Mm -hmm. But if you are trying to keep your channels super, super thin, and you'll see that when he moves to this, the thinnest stylus that we own, mm -hmm. you want to try to have your uh, Dremel tool as directly up and down as possible so that you keep that channel or that groove super small. Let me show you from this angle. Sorry, guys. Focus. There we go. And those are, I don't even know, how, how mm -hmm. big would you call that? That is probably... A sixteenth of an inch. Yeah. This one will be mm -hmm. between a thirty-second and okay. a sixteenth. And yeah, one quick thing here: you'll see your different uh, Dremel tools. They're going to be of different thicknesses. Like this one again is very, very thin compared to the 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 base or the oh, the shaft here. of it. Right. Okay. So there's that point where you just loosen this up a little bit more, and this whole piece comes out, and you've got that's called know, the collette. And we yes. did we did put in our Amazon store mm, that yeah. there are two different sizes. There's the size that comes with it, which is the bigger size. Mm -hmm. You want the three thirty second collet, which is the one on this right. side for the smaller ones. But again, this is this for most of your standard pieces. You'll have the larger, and again, that just slides out. This one comes in. Like I said, the the fan piece is an accessory. Uh, it's not needed. It's not necessary. But I got it just like oh, I wonder how good of a job it's going to do. Eh. So, you have the ability to modify how deep in you put this piece. Right. The further out you go, the less control you have, but the more mobility you have to move your thing around. When you put it in deeper, you have much more control. However, I will tell you, I made the mistake once of angling it, and this spinny fan yeah. started burning into yeah. <laughs> the block itself. Yeah. Okay, so same thing. We're going to go just one hole down so you can see the... I'll do it right next to so you can see the hole variations. So on five... One, two, three, four, five. 
hang on. We'll talk about it later. Wrong way. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't seem significant. Let me show you overhead. Hang yeah. on. Okay. Like, got it. So the holes don't seem significant, but I'm going to use the, the larger one. And you it can't just, see because your hands, your, okay. your shadows yeah, in the that's way. That's okay. But the larger one, you know, it's part of it is the head is very close but if you but the biggest part is how how wide the stylus flares out where this is more that needle sharpness so that's going to make a difference too as you penetrate depth especially if you're needing something like like if if on this like the bosses on these shields if we wanted those to be basically hollowed out which going, is what we're going to do. Yeah, so going straight down with this and getting that depth, I can go as deep as I want to, well, as far as that, if I chose to, where this, there's going to be that point where as it starts to widen out, it's going to compromise what I'm trying to do with the block. So I prefer the thinner piece. Me too. Um, and again... But you, they're both good to have depending yeah. on how much space you need to clear. Yeah, and it's you, you start with what you get. And then, you know, there's, uh, oh, God, the what's the name of the wood store down the... Do you I think what? it's called The Wood Store. Yeah, The Wood Store. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's south of us. I'm sure they're closed right now with everything going on. But you can buy these individual um, pieces, individual tools. You can get the kits. I'm sure you can, you know, order things online as well very easily. But I will, we will get the the serial numbers of the various pieces and we'll get those up with sometime this weekend i'm working tomorrow about 10 hours so um so sunday we'll try to get those online for you guys so um so watch for that any other questions not right now okay duchess rebecca is leaving goodbye your grace Bye bye. she says thanks so much for the class i know it's not finished but i need to step away nope, not i'm not seeing any other questions um, so are you basically done with sort of your presentation on the power tools themselves? Okay. So let's sit this, let's put this back. Woo, it's too close. You guys just got to see up my nose. Hang on a second. Okay. You will get dust Everywhere. all over yourself. I mean, it just. Which is why we didn't wear garb, but we kind of wore sort of nice clothes so that we weren't total schleps. So. Um, in terms of tips for the rotary tools themselves, many of the tips that apply for the manual block carving are also true, obviously, mm -hmm. with the yeah. power tools or electronic tools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if when you're starting, again, start on your edges, get comfortable with the tools. Um, for the broader areas, you want to work away from your pattern most of the time and there'll be times where you're going to be oh cool it's just making a curved line and you just use the stylus and you're just going to trace it on around and you'll be fine um but again it's just again just get used to it play with it um if you make mistakes hopefully it's not a horrible mistake and if it's if it's minor like i said yeah this stuff is is really really great for just, the win! <laughs> yep. You just follow the instructions, let it harden, and then you can sand it off or scrape it, scrape we, it flat. We waited one whole day just because yeah. we weren't sure how. I, I would say probably within two hours it was good, but we waited one whole day just to make sure because we'd never used it before. You can get like a big old jar of this stuff for like 12 bucks, which technically per ounce is much more cost effective. But, I mean, this thing is basically almost 
completely full still. Mm. And it's a, I think, a one ounce. Yeah, one fluid ounce. Mm -hmm. So I think this was like six ninety nine. So if you're trying to keep things kind of on a budget, even though it's not the best price per ounce, mm -hmm. it will keep things kind of low. And for the amount that you'll probably need, that's the, the right choice for most people. Yep. So also for um, rotary tools, use medium speed to start. Now, I, do you always use medium speed? No, I don't. If I got large <laughs> swaths, and again, I'm comfortable with it, but again, it's really, it is it is easy. You're like, okay, cool, I've got this on. And you're like, whoa. And at that speed, the mistakes happen. If they happen, it's quick. Yes. Um, so that the going half speed with the Dremel is just gives you, so you're not taking away, um, you know, more than you need. I might, you know, I might have to go over it three times instead of two times. Okay. What's, you know, right. but. But I, I have definitely used it on high speed too. So when mm -hmm. you started talking about medium speed, I was like. I'm kind of a speed demon because mm -hmm. I tend to use mine on high. But I did, when I started, yeah. I had it down low too. So we recommend mm -hmm. that. So go on medium speed until you feel comfortable. If you're already very comfortable with the Dremel tool in the first place or power mm -hmm. tools in general, yep. you may. But I would still recommend it since linoleum is probably a new medium for most of you that are watching tonight. Um, you tend to want to use the rotary tools for the big wide open spaces. We already discussed that. And then just like we discussed uh, with the manual tools. Manual tools, you're going to want to leave at least a sixteenth of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. Whereas the power tools, you want to leave a little bit more because it does soften and weaken the linoleum. Even if it appears to still be there, trust me, it's all starting to get a little squidgy mm -hmm. under there. So. Yeah. Um, we talked about beveling down the corners of your blocks. That is important for when you're rocking and actually trying to do the transfer. Um, I would not bevel them down any more than half of the total height or depth of your block itself. And then uh, Lothar's already talked about the shop vac itself. Mm -hmm. So the last page in your handout is this handy dandy supplies list. You also saw something just like this in the last handout of the last class we uh, had. And this is available in our Amazon store as well as on our blog. Um, but we put it in this in case this was just a standalone document for people who only wanted to do that. And all of the things except for the individual head names of everything for the rotary tool set. However, this piece right here, Diana, 11 piece rotary tool carving and engraving kit, and then it's got the Dremel uh, SKU number. That one gives, I think, um, the two styli, it gives your beryllium sphere, as you call it. It gives like that that more cylindrical looking one. Mm -hmm. What this doohickey? We'll we'll get right names for you. But it gives you that and a whole mix of things. It's Eleven different heads, basically. And I I think that was fairly cheap, somewhere like twelve sixteen bucks. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to buy the things individually, <clears throat> you end up paying more especially if you're going to yeah. get three heads. If you're going to get your beryllium sphere, a mm -hmm. cylindrical one, and the, the skinniest of the styli, I think it ends up being more than just buying the 11-piece right. kit anyways, which is why we weren't too terribly worried about mm -hmm. finding out what the names were because we were just going to recommend that you get that 11-piece set mm -hmm. anyways. Yeah. So, and again, the little f fan attachment, it's... Eh, mediocre at best, but it was an interesting, interesting it, buy. I think so. right now on Amazon it's like four ninety nine or three ninety nine. Mm, yeah. So it's it's not going to be completely life saving, mm -hmm. but it, it does reduce the amount of times that you're doing, you know, brushing right. things away. So the, the last couple ones that I was doing, like right in here, it just really, really gummed up, and you saw me kind of move my my hand just to get some of the the dust and stuff. So that's where I would actually very ah. That's where I would be using the shop vac. And I use often. an old toothbrush. There you go. So I just kind of brush it out of the way. Same thing yeah. if you want to hand me the other Chosses one because you can, they'll be able to see that. Yeah, this one, that one. Yeah. So basically, and up here you've got a ton from when we use the Dremel. So if you don't want to turn the shop back on every single time or you just want to do it at the end or you just want to do a quickie, there you can see that it very much cleared away most of the dust that is otherwise kind of sticking to things there. Mm -hmm. So, all righty. So let's wrap things up. Um, we've gone over the accent blocks so that you can get a sense of what was done and maybe start to aspire to what you want to do, um, both in terms of motifs and the types. We also talked about how you want to transfer your design elements and the things you want to think about when you're creating or designing the motif that you want to put on your block. 
We talked about manual tools, both linoleum tools as well as the wood carving tools. And then we mm -hmm. talked about the rotary set. We gave you tips and tricks along the way. Does anybody have any other questions? This is sort of our question and answer period. And we'll move this closer because we're old. We, keep, we say that a lot, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Let's scroll. Thank you both. I need to run. Bye, Hillary. Uh, any other questions at this point? We just both aged like 15 years. <laughs> okay, so we'll let some questions come in um, as we kind of wrap things up. Mm -hmm. If you are a member of the Mid-Realm, if you're a resident of the Mid-Realm, this is one of the approved RUM classes, virtual online classes. It is good for two hours, and it is good in the technical and studio arts because it's mostly working with tools and more about the carving of the blocks itself than about the actual application um, to the fabric. You should be able to add it to your transcripts. If you go to rum.midrealm.org, you will be able to sign in. If you don't already have an account, you can create an account, and then you can just start adding your classes. You can build as a student, uh, you can get a licensure degree, degree, a graduate degree, and an adept degree. degree. Could people from other kingdoms be part of that? Um, I don't know if other people from other kingdoms would care about being part of the True. Royal University of Midrealm, but it wouldn't hurt. However, if other kingdoms have similar situations and they're allowing for kingdom level classes, if you need any information in order for me to get into that system to provide the right information, just shoot me a message and we'll be happy to do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, I have earned my licensure and my graduate degree. I'm working towards my adept. Mm -hmm. um, you are working towards your licensure. <laughs> Licentiate. Um, and then <laughs> as a teacher, you can be a lector or an ac academician. Mm -hmm. I am already a lector, and I'm working yeah. towards academician. You are working towards lector. Like Hannibal Lector. Yes. All right, some questions and comments. Bryn, I may have missed this earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, when connection when connection was dodgy, is there a place... Is there a place for block printing with Norse persona? Good question. Let me come back to that because that's a little off topic, but I, it's a favorite topic of mine. Kayla says, thank you. Very comprehensive. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Odette says, other kingdoms might allow it. Great. If awesome. it does. And it, like I said, if you need any more information or if I need to fill in some form so that it'll count for any similar type degree or program that you're working through, just let me know. And that's all that it says. So mm -hmm. um, Bryn asks about Norse block printing, and this is a, a hot debate. So the quick and easy answer is that we do not have any extant proof that the Norse or Vikings during the Viking Age um, utilized block printing. We have nothing, no blocks, and we have no fabrics or textiles. I think it is very much probable that um, the later period Vikings and certainly the Varangian Guard had access to block printing through trade routes. And that is actually a huge um, paper and blog that I'm working on. And I just actually created a graphic and was sharing it with uh, Mistress Ronveg to see what her thoughts were on it. And she was very excited about it as well. We have extant block printing um, proof in the 9th or 10th century in... Um, the, an area around St. Petersburg. And then we also have near Kiev, Ukraine, two, two, actually three more blocks. Two of the blocks, we have the round blocks if you want to grab them. Uh, but those date to more like 10th or 11th century, um, maybe even 12th century, depending on um, which academician you listen to. But yes, Varangian is personal. Varangian persona, yay for me, correct. So these are our interpretations of the two Kievan Rus blocks that were found in uh, Chernigov, Russia, or not Russia, Ukraine. Um, and then there is a third block that was found that was only a very small fragment, and I'm also working on that. Then, working on a blog on that, sorry. Then this piece right here, is from Osberg. Help me with the date. 834? 934? This, this I don't remember. So these are two artistic interpretations of a woven silk um, that I don't think exists anymore. I think it has since fallen to the ravages of time. But we created a double block process 
where this is your bottom block and then this is your top block that goes over top of it. And if you want to hold on, I'll grab a, an example of what it looks like. So the neat thing, story behind this one while she's getting that is that she did the first block and then she waited 20, 25 minutes and then she did the second block. And the, this piece was, oh, how long did it take you to totally block for the His Excellency? 20 well, hours. 20 hours. 20 hours of block printing. Where it's usually... Over two days. Yeah. So, and of course she's doing this for I don't know how long and I, and I come down and I'm like... Have you tried a blow dryer? <laughs> Which did speed up the drying process significantly, but still 20 hours for one outfit. 20, and it was because there were 520 individual stamps or blocks. So if you look at this, you can see... Nope, nope, it's fine. You can see different colors, obviously. But that is my interpretation of it. So I don't, I cannot say in good conscience that the Vikings or Norse, especially earlier on, necessarily had access to it. But we do also have some indicators that Europeans broadly um, had access to it in trade routes. There are some are people that think it was as early as the sixth, fifth, or sixth century. They are wrong. I will tell them why they're wrong shortly in a paper that I'm writing. Um, they had they had misinformation from a gentleman who had misinformation. And unfortunately, that misinformation has been repeated over and over and over again and put into enough books over and over and over again that it has become the common knowledge of how early block printing was necessarily or can be proved to be in Europe. But I have spoken with uh, two different curators in France and in Germany and unfortunately that information cannot actually be proven it's wrong so um let's see same question on the other side i know they had a lot of trade contact any sign that blocks were used no in europe you're looking at probably no earlier than 9th or 10th century where we can definitely demonstrate is it plausible yes and this was actually in our last class um we know that variations of block printing and resist dyeing and mordant dyeing and that whole category of putting awesome prints on your fabrics sprung up simultaneously in prehistory throughout the world. We know that it was a, we have an extant piece from South America in Peru uh, between 500 BCE and the Common Era. And I have to say it. I'm not saying that it's aliens, <laughs> but it's aliens. Or they were like, hey, why should we do this over and over and over again? Much like the ancient Sumerians who had the concept of, I don't want to block. I don't want to individually hand paint this design over and over and over again. How can I make this easier on myself? Because if nothing, humans are the inventions through laziness. So I cannot tell you that there are any extant pieces that deal um, with Ireland any earlier than like 15th or 16th century. More questions. Siobhan says, ooh, Osberg. Kayla says, I missed it, but what inks do you use? We personally do not tend to use inks on most of our projects. We use house paint. We would recommend an acrylic or latex-based house paint, um, and you want to get a flat or a matte, you, or maybe even a semi-glossy if that's your yeah. only choice, but I would recommend the yeah. flat or matte. Do not get glossy and do not get exterior. Yeah. And then there are links to the Speedball inks, that uh, a lot of people use, but I don't like them because I think they bleed too much. Uh, work smarter, not harder. So, yeah. I'm I'm very smart sometimes and also sometimes really dumb. And, like, him introducing the power tools would have never been anything I thought about because I just thought, ooh, this is cool, I want to do it. How do I do this? And I started picking up things I had around me that I knew what to use and knew, feel com felt comfortable how to right. use. So that's why. Yeah. Which you can't see, but this is a package for with a disposable scalpel. That that's how she started. That's how I that's how yeah. I carved their Royal Majesty's block exclusively with scalpels. Never again. Mm -hmm. 
So, okay, so we are basically at time. We're gonna wrap up with a couple other things. We talked about your rum credit, where you can go to register for it, mm -hmm. how you can put it in the system. It's worth two credits. Um, if you are interested in more about the history of block printing, um, you have a couple of options. From our last class, if you didn't see it, it is up on YouTube, which is in the YouTube link that is pinned in this thread. Um, our, on our YouTube channel. If you like us, subscribe. And hit notifications. We just got, we got 100 subscribers, so now we have our own vanity URL for for Am or not Amazon. We do, we do actually, we have an influencer account with Amazon too, but we um, have a YouTube vanity account. And then when we get to a thousand, then we can actually live stream on YouTube, which actually gives us more functionality. So the subscriptions do help us. Um, at, at Penzik, we have on Thursday, July 30th at 1 p.m. That is during Peace Week. And then also during War Week on Wednesday, August 5th, also at 1 p.m. I will be teaching a two-hour class on both of those days on the history of block printing. And it is all like every possible um, avenue and thing you want to know about block printing in the early periods through about, uh, actually through the end of the Middle Ages, you will want to attend that or watch our video on YouTube from last week, which has a very quick primer about block printing. Um, and then we will be putting out more and more content between now and Penzik to hopefully keep you guys entertained because we know mm -hmm. a lot of people are stuck and bored. Um, I think that is essentially it. Uh, so if you want to, we will stick around for a little while online, not live streaming, but we'll be around on Facebook. So if you want to start putting your tools to use and seeing mm -hmm. um, how things work, and if you get stuck, you can send me a video chat and I can walk you through it. Mm -hmm. Bucket says, although I don't plan on carving a block anytime soon, I loved watching this. We're very glad to hear Love that, Love you, Buckets. Buckets. Thank you. All right, guys. So that is the end of our presentation. We appreciate you all coming out. Make sure to go to our YouTube channel, which is mm. youtube.com slash C slash Harpy and Hag. Otherwise, go to our blog, harpyandhag.com slash blog, and you can follow us there. Are you laughing at me? I am. Why are you laughing? That's okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. We'll see.